Okay. Well, I was working on, remember, this two-period diagram. And you have this market opportunity line showing you borrowing and lending. You have consumption in time period zero. And then you have some leftover money, right? And so you're able to invest that leftover money. Actually, let's highlight that, right? So you have some money invested, right? So you have some level of consumption now, some level of consumption in the future. And this is based upon preferences. It's a particular mix. And remember that really, right, all along, all along the consumption possibilities line are possible combinations. Possible combinations of this consumption uh, mix, we could call it, uh, between the two time periods. And it depends on you as an individual. You have to bring your tastes and preferences for consumption into the mix. And then I just note, wait, hey, what happens if R decreases? Right, if R decreases, say, say as, as I say, the previous, let's say previous slope was negative 1.15. And then now it's uh, 1.10. See, in time period t0, right, you're able to borrow at a better price. So borrowers would be happier, right? And the uh, lenders, those are persons who are now less happy. They get less for their lending in that period. And then I mention here in this in this setup right here, I say, what happens if you had more wealth at time period W0, uh, or, or the wealth figure that you have at W0, if you had a, a, actually maybe you inherited a thousand and then you earned a thousand. So, you, so you'd have to take your total wealth and you'd have to add in that adjustment uh, in wealth uh, available to you in time period zero. So you see this little adjustment, this upward adjustment, and then you just reorient the consumption possibilities upwards. These are up arrows. Just in a parallel shift up along that line there. So I'm just taking this analysis uh, and showing you that you can proceed with a little bit of geometry. And it's um, the next thing we want to look at uh, is a productive and market opportunities. Again, it's in a one period setup. And we'll say we're dealing with productive investments, right? And we're going to look at market opportunities. And what I want to do is just examine the, our ability to lend or borrow at a market rate of interest on this market opportunity line. Let's say that you have uh, some productive investment opportunities, okay? And so we're going to invest in real assets. Let's say the market rate of interest uh, R, say, is 10%. So let's make a little chart that shows some possible investments. In time period t equals 0, we'll have this outflow that arises. Time period T1, we'll have an inflow from our project. R star is our internal return, right? Our return on the project. And you have a project at net present value. And uh, since I might invest in multiple projects, I look at the total, the total net present value across the multiple projects, right? So let's say I have investment I1. Investment I2, investment I3. These are real assets. Let's say they each one of them costs me 636. Now, then we got a, an inflow. Let's see. So the first project pays 1272. The second one pays 954. The third one pays 668. And now you see, oh, let's see, it costs across all three projects, $1,908. 
and we get returns here, 2894. Looks like a pretty good deal so far. However, what I want to do is look at things in terms of the margin. We want to judge real investments in productive opportunities at the margin, not in total, not, not all three projects at once. Because these projects have different internal rates of return, right? Investment number one has a 100% internal rate of return. The second one has a 50% return. The third one has a 5% return. So then the net present values are plus 520, plus 231, and minus 29. See, so let's see, I, I would have 520. If I invest in the first and the second one, I would wind up with 751 in NPV. And if I invest in the third one, I wind up with a little bit less, down to 722. So if I have labor income in T0 and in T1 at 1,000, and my wealth from over T, Zero is my labor income at the thousand. T one, thousand, and my wealth in net present value or in, sorry in present value terms was nineteen hundred nine. Just a reminder from the case going previously. And we're thinking, hey, let's take on a project. So our wealth gets to increase, right? Uh, now, <clears throat> we wouldn't want to take on the third project, of course. All right, that would be uh, not ideal, right? So I was going to get right inflows of 668, but uh, that doesn't happen, right? In, in present value terms, I don't want to take on that project. Now, I know I1 is desirable, right? Because the internal rate of return exceeds the market rate of return. So that one looks like a good one. I, too, consider that one. If we take that one on, our wealth is going to go up, too, because the net present value there is positive. And again, the internal rate of return exceeds the market rate of return. Project 3, well, let's see. If you do this one, you know, uh, with just the first two investments, my wealth, would, well, it would be 2661. And when I take on the third investment, my wealth will drop, right? So I would not, I would reject the third project because it's going to actually be wealth uh, diminishing to take on such a project, right? The internal rate of return R star is less than the market rate of return. You'd be better off investing in the pro uh, in the market rather than in the project. So take on I one and I two because they increase well. That gives you the summary that you can take away from this. The summary is, of course, take projects if their net present value is positive. That's the net present value rule. You could say also to take, take a sort of, we'll call it normal projects if the internal rate of return r star right exceeds the market rate of return r that's the rate of return rule and the basic idea is that a project is a better opportunity than the market the next thing you want to learn about is the fisher separation right uh, we're making financial decisions. We're thinking about firm investments. And our objective is to maximize shareholder wealth. How does the financial manager consider the tastes and preferences of shareholders, the owners of the firm? Now, that could be really complicated. Different shareholders will have different consumption preferences. So it turns out we can easily handle this. Basically, the financial manager follows the net present value rule. OK. 
okay makes things simpler for the financial manager and it's a simple rule right that makes things much easier and we're going to try to maximize the value of the firm the wealth of the shareholders and then you leave it up to the shareholders who are free to choose how much they'll consume and how much they'll invest right they could decide to maintain their investments they could increase their investments in the firm they could decrease their investments so the idea is the financial manager is, is basically taking on the wealth increasing projects. So the investment decision is actually separate from the investor's consumption decision. Once you've maximized their wealth, the shareholders can do whatever it is they want to do. This is the separation issue, right? The investment decision. Right, it's separated. It's separated from the investor's consumption decision. This thing is the Fisher separation. Right, and it's named for Irving Fisher, famous economist. To summarize, what is it that the financial managers do for their shoulders? We want them to maximize their wealth. And in our terms, we're saying this is W sub zero. This is what matters if you're a financial manager. That, that's, that's really all we want to do. So this is the third, the end of the, the third lecture. It's posted as a separate file because of that first one got a little long and I had to stop for a variety of reasons too. So let's put this one up.